doing? We doing okay? Fall has hit. It's here. <laughs> My name is Jeff Oaks. I'm the lead minister here. And so if you're new with us, I want to welcome you. We're so glad that you've joined us. Uh, we're getting ready to wrap up a series that we've been in uh, for almost uh, seven weeks. We had one week that we kind of skipped uh, and did a special presentation of a, a missions group that we have. But, but this series in Galatians has been so instrumental in my life. I, I don't know where you have like been reckoning with the material yourselves, but for me, just the knowledge that, that my ability to, to kind of generate God's favor is, is impossible but that God has done something for me in Christ that I could not do for myself. And that grace is something that I accept because of Jesus and I put my faith and trust in him and, and, and it changes my life. I, I, I hope that you're finding that that is seeping into the pores of who you are because I think when it does, it has the capacity to do incredible things. And there's a lot of fruit that comes with, with that knowledge. So as we conclude this last uh, week in the series, I want us to take a look in Galatians 6 together. It's the last chapter of the book. So if you've got a Bible and you want to turn there, that would be awesome. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, we'd love to give you one. We've got some on the back table there. Uh, take one of those as a free gift from us. Uh, the scripture is also going to be on the screens for us. And uh, let's dive in there together. Here's what Paul writes in verse 11 of chapter 6. He says, Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good for others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. Here, here we find ourselves again with Paul circling back around to the same things he was talking about in chapter 1. He's addressing the false teachers who had come into the church who were saying, listen, you know, if you want to really be okay and accepted with God, then you need Jesus. Of course you do. But you need Jesus plus the Mosaic law. You need to obey and fulfill all the rules and regulations there, including circumcision for men. You guys got to be circumcised. And then when you do all of that, God accepts you. And, and here, just as Paul has been saying throughout the letter, Paul says, no, that's not right. In fact, it flies in the face of the gospel. The good news wasn't spoken to you in this way. Paul's saying God accepts us. He loves us, not because of what we do, not because of our good work, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if we ever believe that God accepts us because we've been doing all the right stuff and avoiding all the wrong stuff, that kind of spin cycle of religiosity will just steal our joy because we'll never ever feel like we do enough of the good stuff. And we'll never ever feel like we've rid ourselves of all the bad. Don't you see, if that is your litmus test, you're always going to feel like you're behind the curve. No, there's no freedom in that. Instead, our joy is in Christ because he is the one who made the ultimate sacrifice for us to earn our freedom. You know, I'm, I'm a dad. Um, I've got three kids. I, I've got uh, Aria, who's 13, and Mira, who's 11, and Asher's bringing up the rear. He's two. He's keeping us young and, uh, and, and active. And... Um, and I was thinking about this the other day because, you know, I love my kids and I, I want the relationship that we have together to be uh, good and healthy and full of joy. And so as a, as a dad, whenever I'm trying to help them learn some responsibility and learn things to do, you know, I want their obedience to the things that I ask them to do to come simply because it's a joy for them and not because they begrudgingly think that that's the way that they earn my love. You know, do you think that if, if I asked my kids, you know, you know, tonight, you know, if you want me to tuck you in and, and give you a kiss, then I want to make sure that you did all the chores and things that, that you did. It, do you think that that kind of way of operating with them would, would engender real honest love back from them? You know, if we had a bad day 
And instead of going up to, you know, pray with them at night and give them goodnight kisses, instead I, I yelled from the bottom of the stairs, you know, sorry punks, no kisses tonight. You guys didn't do all the stuff that I told you you had to do. You know, if, if I did that, you know, would, would that show them that my love is unconditional and that I care for them no matter what? Or would that tell them that my love is very conditional and it's based on their performance? No, see, I love my kids because they're mine, not because they perform well. And so if I say, kids, today I'm going to treat you with kindness as long as you follow the rules and do what I say, they might obey for a while, but over time they would come to resent me. See, conditional love, love with strings attached, always leads to relational disintegration. You know, what we're wanting to know from our God is not that, that we measure up because if, it, if it's a requirement that we always measure up and that's the only way we're going to earn his love and affection, then there's, there's going to be that lingering resentment there. I, I can never do enough. I can never free myself from all the bad stuff. But, but God has a different plan for us in Christ. You know, several years ago, I was walking with, um, you know, just having a conversation and, and talking with somebody who was a friend of mine who was describing why she had walked away from the church when she was in her 20s. And I'll never forget her words. She said, you know, Jeff, I just knew that I couldn't walk straight. I just knew I couldn't walk straight. And so I just walked away from the whole thing because I figured if I can't walk straight, then why even try? And deep in our hearts, I think there are probably some of us here in this room who are saying to ourselves, you know, if, if God is going to love and accept me, I have to walk straight. I have to get rid of that persistent sin. I have to try harder to be more kind and loving. I need to be more generous. And then when I do that, I know God, his face will shine down on me and his love and acceptance will pour in my life. I just have to walk straight. But don't you see? You're trying to build a relationship with God on a lie that will only lead you away from freedom in Christ and toward fear and condemnation. And so you might ask, well, how do I know whether this is my mindset or not? How do I know whether I'm really operating with God in a way that's like you know, approval-based, you know, me kind of working my way through this thing on my own? I want to make a few suggestions to you, ways that you might be able to consider, is this me or not? Or am I truly just resting in what Christ has done for me? Here, here's a couple questions to ask. Is there confidence in your walk with Jesus today? Do you have confidence in the fact he is your savior? You know, as you approach God today in this worship time, as we are singing these songs of praise together, did you come with joy and confidence in his mercy? Or are you preoccupied with the ways you feel like you fall short and with the ways you feel inadequate in his presence? You see, in Hebrews, Paul writes in chapter 4, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and will find grace to help us when we need it most. Not when we need it at least, like we were doing all the great stuff. But when we needed it most, when we were on our worst day, on our last leg, when the chips were down and we felt like, man, nobody would ever love me in that state, that's when Christ's grace came to help us. Can you walk through your day delighting in the truth that God takes joy in you as a son or daughter? That's a, that's a second great question to ask. Not only do you have confidence that in Christ you've got God's grace and his favor, but, but that God actually delights in you. That he takes joy in who you are and the nuances of your character and your personality. He made you just like you are with all of your little special picadillos and all the little things that make you unique. In Romans 8, we read what Paul writes there. He says, you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. 
Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba, Father. That's, that's daddy. That's what it says there. You know, when my, my little boy, two years old, when he calls me daddy, there's something about that that's just endearing, right? And that's how God would choose us to relate to him. Daddy, because he loves us. He cares about us. He views us as a masterpiece. Are you able to take delight in God knowing that he takes joy in you? That's another great way to evaluate and ask yourself, am I, am I really resting in who God is or am I kind of working my, my own salvation through my own good works? Final question. Do you believe that God is committed to your joy or are you anxious that God's love depends on your loveliness? Do you believe that God's God got a plan for your life and there's There's good that's a part of that plan. Even if that means walking through the valley of the shadow of death, sometimes to to trust and know that he's with you, you know, one day there is a, a promised hope beyond this life that is full of joy. Do you have the ability to rest in that and understand he's committed to seeing that through in your life? Or do you constantly find yourself hedging and wondering if you're lovely enough? See, in Philippians, Paul writes the church there in Philippi, and he says, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Now, all these things that end up being conditions of our heart that put us in opposition to simply resting in the grace of God through Christ They compete for our heart's affection. They compete for our joy and our freedom. And Paul is telling us here, don't get bound up in that treadmill. It will never satisfy. Rest, take joy, find your heart's delight and contentment in the fact that God has done something for you in Christ you could never do for yourself. He knew from the very beginning our our ability to fall short, the pitfalls that we find ourselves in. And he made a plan for that. He made a way for that. Trust in his plan. Trust in the one that he sent. Let's be honest. If you can be honest with me for just a second. You know, at certain moments, every single one of us can relate to God based on our own goodness. You know, we, we find ourselves trying to measure up rather than simply letting the mercy and goodness of Jesus flood our hearts, we lose confidence when that happens. Have you ever lost confidence in this? Have you ever found yourself second-guessing the whole thing because you just can't imagine how God could love me with all my faults, with all my mistakes? Well, in the next few moments... As we prepare to celebrate communion time together in a kind of a special way today, I want us to look together at one verse from our text that has the power to completely transform the way that we relate to God. One one verse that can be the linchpin for you in disassociating yourself from that former way of operating and stepping in to just the joy and the freedom that Christ offers us. Here it is. It's verse 14 of Galatians 6. Look there with me. Paul writes these words. He says, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. Boasting. You know, let's talk about boasting for just a second. For most of us, we equate boasting with arrogance, right? With kind of a prideful way of, hey, look at me, look what I can do kind of thing. It has a very negative connotation. But let me help you see boasting from another angle. You know, my, my children are constantly trying to get my attention to show me the different things that they can do, right? Uh, you know, 
if they made their way onto the, the honor roll with, with their grades, you know, they might just happen to kind of mention, hey, Dad, did you, did you notice or did you hear that, you know, I got, got on the honor roll? Be- because that's something that they want me to be able to take pride in them in, and so I'll acknowledge that and I'll be glad for that. Or, you know, if, if they, uh, you know, when they learn to ride a bike, Dad, look, look. You know, I, I can ride this thing. I, I, and, or, or, Dad, did you see that, you know, on, on that test that I did, you know, I, I aced it, I nailed it. And I, I watch them do that, and I think to myself, you know, that's great, and it is. But what are they doing every time that they say something like that? You know, Dad, look at what, what I can do. It's a form of boasting, right? And you and I, we probably do the same thing. Well, you do it. I, I would never do any boasting. Um, you know, what, what did you do the last time you came back from a really cool vacation that you had, right? You probably pulled that coworker that you have a good connection with aside and said, hey, check out these pictures. Look what I got to do on vacation, right? We boast about our accomplishments at work, uh, that promotion that we received, the fact that we got into the school that we applied for that we didn't think we'd make, but we, but we got the, the acceptance letter, the fact that we bought a new house, we often boast about these things and say, hey, look at this. Look at what, look what, what's happened to me. Now, please hear me on this. The majority of the time, I don't think there's a, a shred of anything wrong with that. Because all of those things that I've just described, they're, they're simply a natural way of us inviting people in, into the celebration of our life. That's not the kind of boasting that I think God looks at and says, well, that's prideful, that's, that's good. Unless the whole reason is just because you want everybody to think that you're the greatest person on earth. But most of the time, that's not our motivation, right? What Paul is describing here is a, a different kind of boasting. He says in the text, there's another kind of boasting that goes on deep within us, and it's this. Whatever you look at and you say, this is the thing that makes me acceptable. This is the thing that makes my life count. This is why I matter. That kind of boasting can be very dangerous. Some of us might find ourselves like the Pharisee in Luke 18 who prayed like this, I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else. I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I am certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. There is a pitfall here, right? Some of us come to God and we say, God, you should accept me because I have been the best husband I could possibly be. Man, you know how much I've sacrificed to to make our marriage work. Or, or, God, you know that I have been the best mom to these kids that I could ever be. You've got to accept the fact that I've been doing my hardest. Or I paid my taxes. Or I, you know, I've, I've worked hard. I've, I've, I've earned everything for my family that I could. Or, you know, God, look at how much I give away. I'm, I'm very generous. Or I'm nice to my neighbors. Or I'm better than the majority of those terrible people who make it onto the news at night with those terrible things that they've done. God, at least when I compare myself against them, you know that I'm way better than they are. When that happens, when that's our attitude in our prayer life or even just in the way that we think about our relationship with God, we're boasting in ourselves, our ability to measure up. Our morality, our virtue equals God's acceptance. God, you have to accept me now because I've been walking straight. And then there might be some of us on the other end of that spectrum, right? You know, that's kind of the people on this end of the spectrum, man. They're trying to do everything they can. Just live as perfectly and flawlessly as you can. But then there's some of us who are like on the other end of that spectrum, right? We don't consider ourselves religious in any way. We're not trying to earn any approval from God at all. We're not even sure maybe if we believe in God. And if that's you this morning, I'm, man, I'm pumped that you're here. Thanks for coming and investigating and checking it out. And, and, and it's, it's good that you're here, and if that's your mindset, you know, here's what you need to know. We all worship something, right? Everyone looks to something 
that allows them to say, this is why my life matters. And so if you're on the religious end of the spectrum, you're trying to do all the right things to make God approve of you. And if you're over here on this end of the spectrum, you might find yourself simply saying things like, well, you know, kind of like a rich man here in, in Luke 18, the, the later part of the chapter we just read, who comes to Jesus to ask, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's kind of skeptical. And to make a long story short, Jesus looked at the man and said, well, you've got to sell everything you own, and then come follow me. And the text says that the man walked away sad because he was exceedingly rich. He had been kind of taking all his chips and pushing them over into the category of his wealth because that was the thing that he felt made him worthwhile. Some of us are like him. We say, well, you know, look at my lifestyle. Look at, look at the things that I've accomplished. I'm well-educated. People think highly of me. You know, I'm a beautiful person. I'm free. Nobody can tell me what to do. And that's why my life matters, because I'm an individual over here doing my own thing. And that's how some of us boast. But don't you see, both religion and irreligion are a way of saying to God and to others, look at this, look at me. This is what makes me acceptable. This is why I count. This is what makes my life matter. And for the last five weeks, we've been trying to show that both religion and irreligion will ultimately leave you with an emptiness inside, an inability to stay on the hamster wheel and keep it spinning. And at the bottom line over here, just an emptiness because your life can never really fully revolve around yourself without at some point it collapsing in on itself. Paul tells us, you must find something better to boast in, something that can bear the weight of your existence, something that's worth living for. What is it? Look again at verse 14. Paul says, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says there's only one who can bring lasting meaning and purpose to our lives. Only one who can bring us back into a right relationship with the God who made us. There's only one who's worthy of boasting in. And his name is Jesus. Now notice Paul doesn't just say, may I never boast about anything except Jesus. What did he say? said, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's an interesting way of stating it, isn't it? What is the cross after all? I mean, historically, the cross was used as an instrument of torture and death. It was an execution's uh, location. It was the, the thing that was a torturous worst of criminals kind of end of your life kind of moment, right? It was a horrific thing. It's kind of ironic in some ways that now we put it on our neck as like an adornment, right? Here's my pretty cross. When, when really it's like if you'd worn that around in the first century, people would have thought you're crazy. Why would you put a cross on your neck? That is like horrific. It's like wearing an electric chair, you know, or a noose. And so why then does Paul say, boast about the cross? It was the thing that killed Jesus. Why would Paul want to boast about something so awful? Well, it's because Paul understood the beauty of Jesus' death, the meaning that was imbued in every aspect of what he was doing while he was on that cross for us. The Apostle Peter actually describes it this way. In 1 Peter 2, he says, Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Jesus carried our sin on the cross 
so that we don't have to face the punishment that our sin deserves. Alienation from God, separation from him. You know, I got to ask, you know, what sins are in the back of your mind, the thing that you're terrified by, right? That you'll never outlive, that someone's going to find out about. Jesus carried those sins so that you can live for what is right. That's what Peter wrote in those words. Just this past week, um, our staff has been meeting with another church staff, and we've been doing a, a, a Bible study together. We've been working through some material. And uh, this week, we talked about the, the strongholds that sin can sometimes hold in our lives, which was a really challenging thing to wrestle with. It's kind of good that we were all uh, church staff people and that nobody else was around because we can kind of be honest right there, you know. Otherwise, we might get fired, right? Because... Because we all have that stuff that's sitting there, lurking in the the dark spaces of our hearts that we don't want to bring into the light of day. And those strongholds oftentimes are the last things to go, the last kind of little vestige that, that we have difficulty letting God into. And what I loved about this past week, it was an opportunity to just shine the light on that stuff, to expose it for what it is and the brokenness of it. You know, I had to sit there in front of my peers in ministry and say, you know what, I think that there is bitterness in my life. You know, I've walked through a season um, the last five, six years or so where uh, my wife and I, we, we lost our daughter. Um, and the pain of that experience was uh, shattering for us. And, and we watched our other, uh, our youngest daughter work through a lot of pain and a lot of difficulty with her health. And just kind of one thing after the other, what I realized as we were working through that material is like, I, I think I've got some bitterness in my heart. I, I think that the reason why sometimes I'm angry and don't even know why, so I haven't really quite wrangled with that and just kind of said, God, this is, this is the, the anger and the frustration I have about these experiences. I think there's a component of pride in my life that thinks I didn't deserve that. I I should have had a better shake than that, God. Why did you have us go through that season? And I'm sorry if you're here today and you expect the the pastor of your church to be perfect. (laughs) Walking out the door right now. Um, I'm, I'm carrying around stuff just like you're carrying around stuff. And when we do that, when we say, God, I don't know if I'm ever gonna get out from underneath this burden of feeling like I don't measure up, that I don't deserve your love, and and that I can't imagine how your grace could really flood my life. Well, don't you see? Jesus was wounded so that you could be made whole. Jesus died in your place. He took the judgment and the wrath of God to free you from the sin that so easily entangles each of us, to free us ultimately from the scourge of death because we have a hope that lasts much longer than our lifespan does. Jesus was pierced, don't you see, on that cross to make us whole. And when when you realize what Jesus has done for you, it will humble you. It does. It will cut you right down to size. I love what John Stott, he's a great author, he says about this. He writes these words. He says, every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to say to us, I am here because of you. It's your sin I'm bearing, your curse I'm suffering, your debt I'm paying, your death I'm dying. Nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us have inflated views of ourselves, especially in self-righteousness, 
until we have visited a place called Calvary. And it is there at the foot of the cross that we shrink to our true size. Why do we boast in the cross of Christ? Because the God who thought you were worth dying for is worth boasting for. He's worth your life. He's worth everything you've got. When you were on your worst day, when you were the raging, fist-shaking person at God who despised him for that thing that you had experienced, when you were at the lowest point making the worst decision of your life, breaking apart every last vestige of your integrity, when you were sitting there trying to spin that hamster wheel and do all the right things and realized you just couldn't keep up with it anymore, in those moments, Christ died for you because he loves you so much that he would take you on your worst day and trade places so that you could experience the hope that he has for you. That's, that's a game changer for me. I don't know what it is for you. When you realize that your creator had to die for you, that he was willing to die for you, you no longer boast in your own righteousness. You'll no longer boast in your own lack of righteousness. You're, I'm free to do what I want to do. No, instead, you'll see that Nothing you love in this present moment compares to who he is and what he's done for you. You'll spend your life boasting in his goodness at home with your family and friends, when you're at work, when, when you're just out about in your day. It's the thing that has saturated who you are because nothing else is worth boasting in except for that. Today, I think it's right for us to finish this series by boasting in the cross at these tables of communion. You know, communion, the tasting and the touching, the, the breathing in of, of all of these things with, with the elements that remind us of what Jesus has done for us, it, it stems from that time when Jesus was on the day before he was crucified, gathered with his closest buddies in the upper room, and they were having the Passover meal together. It was a special time in the Jewish calendar, and Jesus took that special moment, and he redefined its purpose. He took the bread that was a part of the meal, part of just the normal Passover Seder meal, and as he broke it, he said, I want you to remember me every time you take this meal. When you take this bread, I want you to remember my body broken for you. And then in the course of the meal, when they came to the time of the cup and the sharing in the wine, he took the cup and he, he transformed the meaning behind that part of the Seder meal. And he said, listen, from now on, when you partake of the cup in this way, I want you to remember the blood that I shed for you. Do it as a way of remembering what I've done. And so when we come to the tables today, when we confess our sin, and it's right and proper for us to do that, to come and say, God, I know that these are the things that you had to die for. We deserve death, but you brought us life. We confess the good works, maybe even that we've been doing to try to earn his love. We confess the things in our life that we love more than we love him. We might even confess a specific sin that we feel like is a stronghold that we just can't seem to break. And we walk to these tables and we acknowledge that it was for those things that Christ died. And we throw ourselves on his mercy. And we pray this way. We say, God, accept me on the basis of Christ's goodness, not my own. God, accept me not because I'm so good. I clearly am not. Would you accept me on the basis of your son and what he's done for me? 
There's really no alternative. Thank God. We celebrate at these tables. They are not a place of burden. They are a place of freedom. A reminder that that death Jesus died, it was a costly thing. Our sin has a consequence. But he's loved us so good and so much that he was willing to walk that path. Have those nails pierce his hands and feet so that we could walk from these tables experiencing freedom, experiencing joy and hope, forgiveness. Man, I hope that the next couple moments that we have around these tables are an opportunity to be reminded that we boast in one thing and one thing alone, the life-giving sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. We trust in him alone. Let's pray about that. Father, thank you that in these next few moments, we get to be reminded again of what you've done for us that, that bought our freedom. Father, forgive us for the things that separate us from you and restore us again through your son. We come to you not because of our goodness, but because of his. We come to you not because we can measure up, but because he did. We come to you not because we've just managed to to crack the code and, and find the perfect way to live to make you happy with us. No. We come to you because we're broken and in need and humbly we acknowledge that you have met that need through Christ. And we need it. We need it today and every day. And Father, my prayer would be as we acknowledge what you've done for us, as we acknowledge the love of Christ poured out for us on the cross, that would radically shift in our hearts our desire to boast about ourselves or to think that we can kind of do enough stuff to make ourselves worthy in your presence. Father, our boasting is in your son. May our lives be a reflection of that because that is our desire. We pray this in Jesus' name.